Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Conversational Witchcraft with me, Dawn the Kitchen Witch. I'm excited to tell you that today we are chatting with the very amazing Charlotte Wilde. She is the owner of the occult shop Eclectic Charge, co-host of the Cosmic Cauldron podcast, and an article contributor at Pagan Pathos. She is a lifelong student of the occult, but more specifically, a practicing eclectic folk witch whose practice centers around the use of natural materials to create magic and further her connection with divinity. Through her platforms, she teaches awakening or aspiring witches some of the fundamentals of witchcraft by sharing her knowledge gained through both research and rigorous trial and error. Charlotte Wilde. Welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you. I'm very excited to talk to you. Welcome, welcome. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It's I'm excited. Ex- it's exciting. <laughs> it's exciting to get to know new people and through this platform be able to like, I never would have met you. Like, this is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Right? Right? That That's really what this has been for me too, getting to find and meet people I never would have before and like-minded individuals at that. Right. Like it is very throughout, throughout COVID and, and, you know, being so isolated, being able to use these platforms like zoom and then learning about podcasting and all that stuff to be able to actually find connection with like-minded people. It's been pretty fucking cool. Yeah, it really has. It it gave me this sense of community I didn't have before. I mean, it's not like um, paganism is so popular that I run into people, you know, <laughs> every once in a while, you'll find somebody, there'll be yeah. like a piece of jewelry and you'll be like, huh, huh. <laughs> can I ask? <laughs> huh. Like, I see you, I see you. Yeah. Like you'd be going through the line at the grocery store and like somebody will say, I used to work at a grocery store, right? So I used to work at Trader Joe's and you, somebody would walk through the line with a pentacle. Now, to be fair, to be fair, the Trader Joe's I worked at is the town over from Salem, Massachusetts. So oh, okay. fucking witches are <laughs> everywhere. And, and you would That's see true. someone just walk through your line with a big pentacle and you'd just be like, I like your necklace. Yes. Or I would like, I would like <laughs> touch my pentacle and look at that person and say like, Bless it be, you know, have a great day. Bless it be, you know, um, does that happen to you? Do you, do people like pick you out of a crowd or do you pick people out of a crowd? Cause you're in the Midwest. Am I correct? No, I am in Florida. Oh so God. I, you're in Florida. I know. Tell Dear me Lord. Funny. I'm sorry. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Oh, I really honey. am. So it doesn't happen very often. This is not exactly the place to be if, if you don't fit a very particular demographic. So, oh, that's hard. Have you been there? Have you grew up in Florida? Yes, my whole life. So watching it uh, turn into what it's turned into is, is pretty sad for sure. Oh God. Yes. I can't even, I can't even imagine. Are you thinking about relocating? Are you thinking about just doing as much magical work as humanly possible to get the other one who shall not be named out of office there? (laughs) Both, all of the above, ah, mainly I, I would, my goal is to get out of Florida, but I have children and they're currently going to school here. And as soon as I can, they're teenagers now, mm-hmm. most of them, I also have a toddler, but wow, yeah, as soon as they're, they're finished with their schooling, I'm out, I'm, wow. I've had it here. <laughs> and and the first thing I'm going to say is for those of you not watching a video here and, and, and just listening, you do not look like you're over 26. So the fact that you said that you have <laughs> teenagers is multiple actually <laughs> that's insane to me so good for you it's the witchcraft um it is it's, it's, it's the witchcraft. that's what's keeping me young yes yes, yes. <laughs> people ask me they're like oh when they find out how old i am because i'm i'm pretty old um and uh, they're like oh my god but you look so great i'm like that's because i drink the blood of my enemies it's not you say that too do you <laughs> i did i said that last week <laughs> fine yes it's fine. Just, just, just all, just all the olive oil I rub yeah. on my skin. It's totally fine. Um, but, but in my own personal interest, because I, uh, love where I live, New Hampshire is beautiful. New England is great. Come on up. That's where I want to go. That is really? like my ideal place. That is what I want to manifest. Really? Yes. 
Yes. Oh my <laughs> God. So my, my partner and I are from, uh, we're from New York originally. And, um, we transplanted from there. Uh, well, oh my God, at this point, it's been like 13 years because we moved to Massachusetts first. And then, uh, like seven years ago, we moved from Massachusetts to New Hampshire because New Hampshire is amazing. The people are lovely. The weather is great. Well, for the most part, the weather is great. Um, but it's just, it's, it's wonderful. So I, I could never say enough good things about it. And it's not as, um, liberal and open as certain other places, but really nobody cares what you, the motto of the state is live free or die. Nobody gives a shit what you do as long as it doesn't bother somebody else. I like that. I yeah. like that. That's a good motto. Yeah. I'm actually always on Zillow looking at houses in that area. I'm like, Ooh. come on up, baby. Come on. <laughs> right. come on. And to be fair, the, the pagan and witchcraft community here um, is one of the reasons why we left New York. One of the things that we uh, we started doing, like this is a million years ago when I started uh, vending and teaching classes at pagan pride events that were in New England. And we were here and we're like, everybody's nice. and There's so much community and wow, this is great. And it was one of the things that made us go, wow, maybe that is where we want to move, you know, because we didn't have that where we, where we lived. So yeah. It's, I can't imagine that there's a big pagan community where you're at. Not at all. There's one shop in my town and maybe two in the city that's larger and close by. Mm -hmm. So, but I went up to Salem and mm -hmm. like the cars would stop so I could like walk across the street. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> Like, why you don't get that here? <laughs> well, that's because everybody lives in Florida is transplanted New Yorkers. And they don't, that's they don't true. run you that's the true. fuck over. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yes. It would be yes. Dangerous. So. It is. It, and there's a, there's a very, they really enforce the laws about like stopping your car when there's a pedestrian. We got, when we were looking for places to live up here, we got pulled over by a cop because we, the person was in the crosswalk, in the crosswalk and they were past us, but they were on the other side of the street, but they were still in the crosswalk. And so we went through person was out of our way and we got pulled over because the law is if someone's in the crosswalk, no matter where, where they are, you have to stop until they're on, on the other side. I would have gotten pulled over too. I had no idea. I know it, it was, it was insane. It was insane. So, okay. You grew up in Florida. Yes. How in the world did you find witchcraft? Oh, uh, really? It came through with TV. TV was like my first, well, that, yes. and, that and always like, there are some wooded areas. It's not just beaches here in Florida. So yeah. I would go out there and I'd make potions and I would get some kitchen supplies and bring it out there. But of course, yeah, a lot of it was just the movies come out around that time. There was Hocus Pocus. There was the craft. Um, yeah. Several other ones. Help! My favorite movie as a kid was Labyrinth, which oh. isn't directly witchy, but but it is, but it, it is, is right because it's myth <laughs> and magic. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, David Bowie, this package. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I didn't notice it watching when I was younger, but I went back and watched it. And I was like, how did I miss that? <laughs> I can remember being like really little. So obviously I'm, I'm older than you because, um, I, I was probably, I mean, I was old enough to remember when, when labyrinth came out and I remember seeing it and being like, you see David Bowie in his pants and you see him in his pants. Yeah, and you really do. You really do. And I remember being like, Oh, what? Oh, what? What? <laughs> maybe I shouldn't look. Maybe. And also like that whole, like he's wearing makeup and he's so pretty and he's feminine but he's also masculine and it that movie and it's funny because the more people you talk to you learn like movies like labyrinth um legend um all those kind of like late 80s uh fantasy movies that were myth and magic they had this kind of awakening for people in uh, you know for for spiritual stuff and witchcraft and stuff so i'm 100 exactly. percent there with you with labyrinth okay like yes <laughs> yes 100 <laughs> were there That's any other like like you said tv stuff like what else 
Who, of course, I watched Charmed. Uh, Buffy. Buffy was a Buffy fan for sure. <laughs> I've actually gone back and started rewatching that recently. So, <laughs> may I may I confide in you? Uh, again, I'm a little older, and when Buffy came out, I was like, "Ew, I hate because it wasn't show. the original movie." <laughs> I loved the original movie, but moreover, it was because at the time I was a very big Anne Rice fan. Oh, and I was like, yeah. I was like, vampires are supposed to be beautiful. And when on Buffy, especially the first season, the makeup was so bad. They were yeah. hideous. And I was like, vampires are supposed to be gorgeous. And they're supposed to, you know, be like the most desirable and, and, and whatever. And so the fact that they didn't have that in Buffy, I was like, mm. and then like two years ago, three years ago, a friend, my cousin, actually, she was like, you have to watch Buffy. It's so, she's like, it was important in my development as a, as a young person. It's important for me that you watch it. And I did. And I was like, this is the best show ever made. <laughs> I'm glad you came around. <laughs> it's the best show ever made. It, it was. I, I appreciate some of the zingers a little more now too. I'm like, I love this. <laughs> Do you watch it with your kids? No, I can't get them into it. They're they're big anime kids and have very niche interest. So what I like, they, they don't know. So at all. was it the character of Buffy? Was it the, just the world building there that kind of made you a huh? Or was it Willow who was like, world I'm- building, But also yeah. Willow. Willow had a big part and I love Allison Hannigan. So I mean, you kind of look a little <laughs> bit like Allison Hannigan. I've gotten that before. Yeah, actually. You do actually. <laughs> like I could I with the right haircut, I could totally see people you like being like, are you are you her? <laughs> so what was it about her character and the way that they incorporated witchcraft into the show that kind of made you go, hmm, maybe this is something I'd be interested in? I actually think a lot of it was a pretty honest reflection of it. I mean, of course, not the the stage magic of it all, but there was a lot in there that really gave you somewhere to look and somewhere to build off of. So I really appreciated her character. And I loved all the other characters, but specifically Willow in there. I think they treated her character in such a sensitive way, not just about witchcraft, but also about her sexuality and yes. how it wasn't, it wasn't a big deal. Right. So yeah. the fact that she was a witch was just something she discovered about herself. Just like the fact that she was gay was something she discovered about herself. And everybody was like, yeah. cool. You're yeah. a witch. You're still our <laughs> friend. Cool. You're gay. You're still our friend. Like yes. it wasn't a thing. It was just something that like, you're a brunette, you're a blonde. This is just who you are. And I think that really does inspire one to feel comfortable who is an observer and yeah. one to feel that this is something that is accessible. Yeah, exactly. Right. That, that acceptance there, you know, particularly in film at that time, it was just beautiful to see. And I, I did, I love the way that they treated that because it, it was just, just straight accepted. You know, they didn't make a big deal out of it. Yeah. Right. I, I don't know. I so truly how do you, enjoyed that one. How do you make the leap from, I love these shows and I love these kinds of movies to finding your actual path. Well, I mean, that, that keeps evolving. I never had it stop evolving. So, you know, it really just started with the books that were available at the time. I, my mother wasn't religious and didn't care what, how, what I believed in. So mm -hmm. I got like full freedom to explore anything that interested me. So I could go into the bookstores and pick up all these books and start learning. And not everything on the page jives with me in any book, you know? So you just sort of take from that and you can start implementing it. If somebody's got a practice or a ritual in there, you can see what works for you and then just sort of sub out what you dislike or if you don't have an ingredient so, right <laughs> yeah, yeah which which happens yes. um and you just sort of develop your own way of going about things your own practice and I think that that is what is most important to me is one being authentic to myself and others being authentic to themselves so they can develop something that really resonates with them and that's that was my exact patches oh okay well this worked great that 
not so much. Right. <laughs> right. So you're a teenager in rural Florida and you're finding, you're finding witchcraft books. You're going to a local shop and you're not being discouraged at home. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're being encouraged to be creative in your spirituality. And you're seeing these role models on television and you're going, Oh, wow. Maybe this is something that, uh, you know, it does speak to me, but maybe this is something that I could actually do. Oh, wait, magic is real. Oh, wait, witchcraft yes. is, is something I can implement into my life. So can you talk a little bit about like, what were some of the first spells or rituals that you started doing that you, do you remember anything like in particular, that was a practice that you would do that was looking back on it, go, oh, that was the foundation of my, my witchcraft. The foundation, I would say that I know for a fact, the first things I did was anything I saw on the craft. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love it so much. Bridget, that, that would be the first, that is not actually still a part of my practice. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I, I got my group of girlfriends in rural Florida. Technically it's a beach town, but we've got some wooded parts here. <laughs> got them all around. Um, but that was my first, I didn't, um, we didn't dive too deep into that. Uh, none of them are still practitioners at this point. I was the only one who held on to that, but right. <laughs> But yeah, those were my first, I would, you know, really anything I saw in that movie. Um, She's, you get the ribbon and you're binding people and like, yes, yes. Column think, corners. Yes. Yep. 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 I think I, I'm definitely sure I, I tried that little ribbon binding spell when I was a teenager as well. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure I did it a couple of times and maybe on ex-boyfriends, it, you know, they probably had it coming. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> okay. That's hilarious. That's absolutely hilarious. So you, what does it mean for you to be, you define yourself as an eclectic witch, right? And I think that a lot of us, like if I, if I really broke down, like I say, I'm a kitchen witch, right? But if I really break that down and go, well, my practice, I say I'm a kitchen witch, but my, my overall practice is very eclectic because I don't stick to one thing, right? For you, what does being an eclectic witch actually mean? That is why I have to use eclectic. It's because it is so broad. There, there's, I couldn't like state it more concisely with any other term. It had to <clears throat> kind of became like a, a catch-all. So for me, I do love, I do love some kitchen witchery. I've been scrolling your Instagram page. Oh. I need some <laughs> olive oil. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this looks delightful. <laughs> yes. um, so kitchen witchery, um, I really enjoy spell jars. I enjoy a good candle spell. A lot of my magic is actually very simple, not very ritualistic. So I have little daily rituals. I like to find it in the everyday. Uh, there, you know, there's times where I'll be more elaborate, but the way for me to stay connected is to do so something small on a daily basis. Um, Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's such an important point. And I was having a conversation with someone else recently and we were discussing these smaller, <laughs> these smaller types of magics. Um, yes, you are frozen. You are frozen. Let's hold one second. I don't know if you can hear me, see me. Nope. My internet connection is unstable. I was recently having a conversation with someone else about these small little ways in which we practice magic, right? Because oftentimes in my experience um, as a kitchen witch, there can be this mentality of kitchen witchcraft being a lesser type of practice because it's not so esoteric, because it's not so occult. We're not dealing with, you know, mediumship and you know, always deal, dealing in, in like, you know, the stratosphere of spirit for mm. me, it's very now it's very right here. It's very tactile. It's very in the moment. Mm. And I was having this conversation with someone else. And she said to me, which was brilliant. And, and I love your opinion on this, that 
doing these little bits of magic every day keeps us connected to spirit, keeps us connected to our craft so that when we are in these larger situations where we want to be in or perform large ritual, it's easier for us to plug into that because we always have that current running through us. Would you agree? Yes, absolutely. And I love the way that is stated so much. That is, yeah, that is how I feel about it. You, you just sort of cultivate this connection and it can be done. So, you know, by doing these little daily rituals, I love kitchen witchcraft. I've got to eat every day. So why not make that magical? You know, I really, I love, I love the, the combination of, you know, the mundane and the magical just. Right. And, and to, to break that down even further and say, if we do things with intention, everything is witchcraft, right? Everything and anything we do with intention, with uh, a positivity or with, with um, vulnerability, with, you know, any type of, of intent becomes witchcraft because we are, we are magic. It's not something we do. It's something we are. Yes. We are magic. I love that. That is it. That's a phrase that I use often. And that's, right. that's how, yeah, I really connect to that phrase because we are, we are magical beings. We are magical beings w- walking through this world. So when that part of us is open and that, that light switch is turned on, then everything from making a cup of coffee to washing our hands, to watering the plants, it's all magical because you can stay in that moment and realize what you're doing is witchcraft you know, and using that term witchcraft as something that is ritualized. The practice of witchcraft is that something that is ritualized in terms of the intention in which we're doing something. I might be, I might be rambling because I'm a little over caffeinated. So apologies. (laughs) Um, But in terms of the eclecticness of your practice, would you also relate that to work with deities? Because you say that this is, you know, not, you use natural materials and simple practices to connect more deeply with divine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. I do have to start out and say that my practice is actually non-theistic. I don't directly work with any deities, which, um, for me, my connection is with the universe, with the earth itself and the energies around me. Love it. But I don't, yeah, I don't have a, a patron deity or anything. I do make room for that in my book. Like if you work with such and such, you know, you could do this. But for me personally, that's not a part of my practice. So when you go. say connect with divine, you mean divine intelligence, universal yes. energy. Yes, exactly. That is what I'm saying when I, for me personally, but I know that it manifests differently for everybody. So I did want to keep that open when I was writing my book. Um, Absolutely. For me, yes. Yeah. For me, can you talk a little bit about how that, how that integrates into your practice, that universal intelligence, that over that, that, that overarching divine energy and how you connect with it? Ooh. Uh, again, I connect with that on a, a really daily basis, but I try to keep myself in a good headspace. I love to practice meditation. Sometimes mm. I fall out of that, but but I can tell when I need it, when I need to to tap into that. I, you know, because I will be going off the rails a little bit. I'm like, you know what I should do? I should meditate because I do understand that that gets. A little difficult sometimes to um, even do the things that we know that we should do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Like eating vegetables, meditating, going to bed early, like the yes. move, moving our bodies, going for a walk, stretching. Yes. These yes. simple things that we all should be doing, right? Um, movement is another one for me. Movement is a way that I can connect. I, I love to dance. So that's another way that I can connect with one, my body, but also divinity, you know, it's a way for me to dial in and, but also ground myself. So that's, that's another common method for me. That's incredible. Have you been dancing for your whole life? Or is that something you started doing as a form of ritual? I have 
Now, when I say dancing, I am not a ballerina. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not formally trained. I just love to move. And it's probably ridiculous. You won't see any video of me dancing, typically. So <laughs> that's for Unless me. Unless it's something you didn't know of. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, right. oh, I'm going to find that somewhere. <laughs> You're going to find somebody's going to be like, oh, this was Charlotte from so-and-so's <laughs> wedding on the dance floor, right? Yes. Yes. Which you, yeah, there's video footage of that for sure. But <laughs> so again, was this something that you, you just said, you're not a trained dancer. So how does that incorporate? And when, at what point did you incorporate that sort of, I would call it like ecstatic movement, ecstatic dance. Yeah. Yeah. How did that sort of, and as I'm even talking about it, like I'm feeling like yeah, this movement gotta in my body, like, you know, <laughs> um, and I'm not that person. Like when I like movement, no. I like yoga and I like slow movement and I like methodical. Mm. Right. Um, but how does that, how did you start incorporating that into your, into your practice? You know, as far as a definitive starting point, I'm not sure. I, I don't have like a, a start date there, but yeah. just so you, you can feel things like you can feel things intuitively. So I've always loved to dance and I would say it's probably been more so, past half a decade where I've really leaned into dancing. Um, I now, I do take classes now, but. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. What but kind of classes are you taking? I actually take pole classes. I have nice. a friend. Yes. I love it. I have a Excellent. friend who's an instructor and um, who's also a witch actually. And uh, it's a good way to one, get to spend some time with her and mm. also get to get to learn about that. And have a, have a different outlet there. That's incredible. I, uh, uh, weirdly enough, also have a friend who's a pole instructor and a witch and See, they go hand in hand sometimes. Right. And, <laughs> and she, I mean, I was like, it couldn't be the same person. Cause you live in Florida and she's up here in Boston. Um, <laughs> but I think you know, one of the things that she really does focus on is, you know, body positivity and that mm -hmm. energy that you're channeling when you're moving. And I do think that's very important. And it's definitely not something, it's definitely not something that people talk about in witchcraft enough because yeah, we are true. still physical beings, right? Yeah. So dance and movement in our physical bodies, helping us channel what's going on in our energetic bodies is definitely yes. not something that we talk too much about. Can you share with us a little bit about how that experience makes you feel? euphoric, I would say is the, the best word for it. And I really, I, I love the channeling portion, but it also puts me back into my body. And sometimes, you know, you need to, uh, for me personally, I can be in my head too much. So it is a way for me to, to get out of there, to get into this physical body, but also to be this sort of conduit for energy. And mm -hmm. I, I find it just, yeah, euphoric is the best way to describe it for me. And I just, I love the way that it makes me feel. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, you talk, you talk a lot about fundamentals, um, in your book, and I'm wondering in your opinion, what would you say are the top three fundament fundamentals in your own personal witchcraft practice? Ooh, um, fundamentals for me would be meditation and getting your mind in the right place. But also at the same time, that doesn't have to be like a more formal meditation, you, it can, you can be moving, you can do it even through dancing, you can find your, your space where you're no longer, you know, pinging from thought to thought, mm. you really have to uh, be present in a way that you might not typically be. So meditative states uh, can, can be accessed in different ways. So meditation first and foremost, but I did want to add that caveat that you can achieve it in multiple ways. The other thing for me is protection magic. I, I believe that that is a very important thing to do. I try to keep my protections around my home on myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, some of the other fundamentals I would say the third most important thing 
is to try things and make mistakes because those are going to be your biggest teachers. (laughs) I love hearing that in terms of witchcraft specifically. I think people don't try things because they're like, well, in my practice, if I, if I mess it up, what, what is that? What's going to, what's going to happen? You know, like, just, just try it. If this is something that calls to you, if, if something is, is pulling you in a direction, try it because that's intuition, that's spirit, that's universe saying, maybe you want to look over here. And conversely, if you try something and it doesn't work, maybe that thing's not for you, but you won't know if you don't try. Exactly. Yeah. You, you have to you have to follow your own intuition because that thing that interests you, that thing that you keep seeing, you know, keeps popping up and you're like, should I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give it a shot. You know, if you don't like it, once you've tried it, or if it doesn't work for you, you can always leave it. But I think it's important to, to try things, you know, to experience things and, and follow what is calling to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And on that note, we're going to take a very quick little break so we can hear from our amazing sponsors. And when we come back with Charlotte Wilde, we're going to talk about your new book, uh, Eclectic Witchcraft, because it's a really beautiful book and there's a lot of information in there. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back from uh, with Charlotte Wilde. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are chatting with the eclectic witch, Charlotte Wilde. And uh, we are about to discuss your really cool new book, which by the way, is freaking beautiful. Uh, Eclectic witchcraft. Look at this gorgeous cover. For those of you that are not watching, the cover is beautiful. Um, It's a gorgeous witch hat with all these flowers and it's just beautiful. It's a gorgeous book. And it's also like awesome on the inside as well. Um, I I have to say um, it's really, it's a really fun book. And like you said, just talk about the fundamentals and stuff. One of the things you talk about, um, is how witchcraft can increase your confidence. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that with us and how, again, in your own personal practice, witchcraft has increased your confidence? Yes, it does. And it does increase your confidence because it allows you to tap into yourself, to get to know yourself in, in different facets than you might not otherwise. Uh, you can use witchcraft to enhance your confidence. I mean, there's glamour magic or for me, I wear their particular color. Well, still glamour magic, but <laughs> um, I'll wear certain pendants. I'll... Uh, utilize little small rituals to help me focus my energy. Um, I had to do it before this podcast, even <laughs> because public speaking, oh, uh, it's not really public. It's just for me. I know. I know. <laughs> I know, but it is, it is a little like when you first you start interview, especially when it's about your book, right? Like yes. this is, I don't know about you. Okay. But like every book I write, I'm like, this is my heart. Please like me. You know, like it's writing is it's vulnerable. It's It's, vulnerable. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It is. It is. Um, so did, (laughs) how, how did you, uh, build up your confidence enough to, to write this using your practices for that? That was a culmination of so many things. I cannot narrow it down to one practice, but I got to a point in my life where I was like, I, I need to write this. I, Mm -hmm. I, excuse me, I have put this down onto paper and, oh, so many things, so many things went into that. It was, I started to write it, um, right around COVID times, um, which really, I think during that time, everybody was sort of going inward and, you know, trying to pursue their passions. And I, I seized that opportunity, sort of that, uh, current of collective energy there. It was, Mm -hmm. it's really cool to see during that time. And I just went for it there. And now how do you feel like do you feel like, oh my God, I can't believe I fucking wrote a book? Or are you like, yes, oh my God, 100%. I can't believe I fucking wrote a book? Like, <laughs> um, more, 
first one. <laughs> I'm leaning towards the first one now. Yeah, good. And you should be. And you should be. You know, I'm I'm so much like, oh my God, I did this thing. And then I get a wave of crippling self-doubt. And then yes. no, I can do it. No, I can't do it. You know, like it's 100%. it's a roller coaster, you know. It but is. you it did is. such a great job. You should be really, really, really proud of yourself. The book is awesome. Um, and one of the things in particular that I love about this book and I really wanted to bring it to the forefront, is that in every chapter, you have a, how do you call it? You call it a broom closet witch. And I think this is really important. And you won't find this, like it's not on the cover jacket. It's not in the description of the book, but in every single chapter, at the end of the chapter, you have a little thing that's broom closet witch tip. For people who maybe are not out about their practice, Oh my goodness. Why was this important for you to put this in the book and talk to us about that and, and your decision to put that in the book, because it is something, again, people aren't talking about. Well, for, for one, my geographical location in Florida, um, contributes to that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I, I don't have to go very far to, um, see exactly, uh, you know, see the, the, flags still flying for particular former presidents. So you know that you're not operating in a safe space, like right. pretty often. Um, so I wanted people who are not as comfortable, who are not, you know, allowed with their practice. And I do understand that. I have only really become comfortable in saying, Hey, I'm a witch in the past six years. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that, it took a lot of work to get there. Like I would, I would study, but I was not forthcoming. Yeah, particularly, you know, there's just there's not many other witches around here. So forming, yeah. forming a community and really getting some support was also fundamental in writing the book too. So, yeah. So to have these little things where you can say to someone, "Hey, maybe you're living with a partner or a roommate or family member." who is not comfortable with what you're practicing spiritually, but you still want to be able to practice. Here's, here are things that you can do to incorporate everyday magic. Yeah. There, there are little things that you can do. And I, I remember it very clearly because I used to have a, a tub under my bed, which would house all my stuff. My tarot cards would be in there, all my books. I didn't want anybody to see, and I would shove it under, under my bed. And that's where I would keep it. So I'm really familiar with this. And I'm, hell, even to this day, like there, there's times where I'll go out and I won't even tell anybody what I do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I understand from the energy that I'm receiving that it's not going to go well. So mm-hmm. I will bypass it altogether. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think especially uh, as parents, that must be very difficult. Um, yes. you know, especially if you have small children and you're trying to raise your children, uh, following, you know, your traditions, and then that kid goes to school amongst perhaps other children that have been taught uh, a closed minded fear-based faith and say, we're all, you know, 95% of the people in this classroom are practicing this closed minded fear-based faith. And then your kid's like, my mommy's a witch, you know, like, yes, that can my, be incredibly, incredibly frightening. I, you know, at this point, my daughter has just sort of become like my liaison in making friends because she's like, mommy, my nurse is a pagan. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> Did you just make me a friend? <laughs> That's fantastic. But yes. Yes. She, um, she's a hoot, but, um, just went blank again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> these, these everyday, these everyday practices, it's one of the reasons why for me, um, kitchen witchcraft, um, is so important and it's such an amazing practice that in, in my own path, because I do come from a very conservative Catholic Italian background. And yes. although there were folk magics being practiced that I'm sure are still practiced to this day within the family that they don't call it that. Um, but I can 
cook a meal with intention. I can use certain herbs or I can use, you know, certain incantation around a meal that I'm creating. And then I can share that meal with others as a way of celebrating maybe whatever I want to celebrate on the wheel of the year or, you know, um, my own, my own holidays with them or whatever magic I want to do. Um, and I can share that with people that don't really understand or care or, or would judge me for that practice, but yet I can still practice with and for them in my own way. And so can you give us an example of one of these things that you would recommend for someone who would want to share something like that? Like you said, this broom closet kind of tip for someone. For, for sharing their practice with others in particular. Um, let's see, for me personally, I am a crafter. I, mm. I love to make things. So for me, my, my husband actually is Catholic. And so that side of the family is Catholic as well. So I, when I'm including everybody in, like I'll make specific holiday candles for them with specific intentions in there. And that's a way for me to share it. Uh, now it doesn't have to look exactly like that for anybody else, but if you, if you have something that you enjoy creating, I think it's the creation portion here. That's the most important. It's, you know, infusing this with with your energy and then sharing it with somebody. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And something like candles is a great thing because everybody burns candles. So you're over there doing it with your intention, with your specific scents and herbs and colors and whatever. And you're going, Oh, I know my Catholic mother-in-law might be going through this issue and she's going to receive this and burn it. And she's just going, this is a beautiful, it's my favorite color. And, and it smells good. (laughs) Meanwhile, you're able to work your magic. Yes. She is my biggest supporter though. So (laughs) that's so wonderful. Yes. Yes. I left out there. (laughs) What a, what a cool what a cool way of advising people to be able to share who they are and what they do in a non-threatening way to keep them safe, but also to keep the family or their loved one uh, emotionally safe as well. You don't always have to be screaming, I'm a witch, I'm a witch. You can keep that practice to yourself and yet still share it in these ways and still provide healing or provide comfort or support to others in these sort of ways that are non-threatening. Yeah, exactly. What that. a cool, what a cool concept. Um, I love that. And again, that's something that really stood out to me in your book. Um, what do you hope for when people pick up this book, when they read this book, what do you hope people get out of it? What I hope that they get out of it the most is when I went in writing it, I wanted it to be accessible. I wanted people to understand that witchcraft isn't one size fits all. So what my practice looks like isn't going to be what your practice looks like. And that's okay. Not only Mm -hmm. is it okay, that is, that's how it's supposed to be. You know, we're all individual people and, you know, we come with our own experiences, our own backgrounds, our own likes and dislikes. And that's going to translate into your practice. That's going to translate into your spirituality and how you experience it. So that above all is what I wanted to get across there. And I, but I did also want to provide some, some ideas and here is how you could do this, but this is also how you could customize it. So I I love that. that. I love that. And, and it really does come across, you know, I think even just in, 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 the word eclectic and saying, make it your own, um, is so important. It's so important. And it is really, it's a beautiful book. It's a beautiful book, Charlotte. You did an an amazing job. And, uh, where could people find this book provided they definitely should go buy it? Where should they find this book and how can they find you and follow you on all the socials and all of that jazz? Um, If you can get it locally, that's always best. They, it will be stocked in Barnes and Nobles, Books a Million. Apparently it's already available on Amazon. I was told that last night. I didn't know. Exciting. (laughs) 
Yes. Yes. Exciting. <laughs> so we are recording this in June. Um, when, so by the time this episode airs, which will be a, a little further out, um, this book will be available. What exactly is the published date on this? June 8th, June 8th. So we're recording this June 3rd. So it'll be any minute now. Um, but by the time this episode airs, which is I think August, this book will be out and be able to be found in all of your local bookstores. And if they don't have it, you can order it. And if you want to, if people want to find you online, where can they find you? Ooh, you can find me online at eclectic charge on Instagram. I also, my podcast page, which is at cosmic cauldron podcast. That's a podcast between me and uh, my best friend, where we talk about different witchy topics every week. And I think I have a Twitter, but I don't actually don't use it. So <laughs> I fucking hate Twitter. Um, okay, good. Yeah, no, I have a Twitter account too. And I'm like, Meh. since Elon Musk bought it, I haven't posted anything. It's just, I, um, oh, I can't, it. I just can't. Um, so, but we'll have all of your, all of your information on the show notes. So if anybody wants okay. to find Charlotte and buy her fabulous book, uh, you can find it there. Uh, eclectic, eclectic witchcraft say that 10 times fast. um the amazing charlotte wild and charlotte before uh i let you go i've got to ask you my signature question so i ask this to everyone it has nothing to do with anything we've talked about all day uh but this is what we ask everyone at the end of the show as a kitchen witch if you could have me make one magical meal for you what would it be and why Ooh, bruschetta <laughs> really I, yes yes <laughs> is that because you were scrolling through my instagram and yes, you're like oh, and I got that hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so i already know <laughs> I, I have converted many many people to loving tomatoes with my bruschetta it's my favorite it's is my it favorite food. is it could you i like to make it and then serve it on like marinated grilled chicken and then oh drizzle like goodness. a balsamic glaze on top. Uh, yeah, I, I make little caprese sandwiches for myself all the time. So like go out and pick my basil. I got my fresh mozzarella. Ah, it's heaven. It, it, that, <laughs> it really, it, that really is heaven. Um, especially like fresh tomatoes, you know, again, yes. like I have a couple of people in my life who never liked tomatoes. My partner being one of those, he hated tomatoes. He would pull them off of a sandwich. And then we got married and I made bruschette and I was like, just try it. And he was like, this is amazing. I'm like, because that's what real tomatoes taste like. Like yes. tomatoes that aren't grocery store tomatoes that have been <laughs> sitting in the cold that are all mealy and gross. Like this is, a that's, that's not a tomato. That's the one good thing that you have in Florida, right? Is that it's sunny and you can grow a lot of stuff year round. I'm growing tomatoes and basil over there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's a that's a benefit. I mean, it's not. It, I know sometimes it's like, you have to battle the sun. Like I go out there, like I'm gonna have to be holding an umbrella over my plants at some point. <laughs> You're frying it. They're frying but... everything is frying. <laughs> Charlotte, you are lovely and delightful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really hope everyone gets out there and buys this eclectic witchcraft because it's really good. And like you said, very accessible, lots of great information in here. Um, I love the little witchy tips. And again, you've got a lot of basics and fundamentals in here. I see this as being a book, not just for someone who, um, has been practicing for a long time, but for someone who is new to the practice or wanting to, uh, have a quick reference guide. I think this is great yes. for a lot of that being able to be like, Oh, what's comfrey for Ooh, open it up, you know, like yes. really, really, really good information in here. Kind of like a one-stop shop. If you are a new, if you're what I like to call a witchlet, if you are a witchlet, this is like a one-stop shop. Like you could start here and go, Oh, this thing sounds cool. That thing sounds cool. So well done, my friend. Well done. Charlotte Wilde. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us here. It was lovely to have you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on today. My pleasure. And until next time, everyone, I wish you so, so many blessings and much, much gratitude. <laughs>